Sorry, I should just. Got it. I know that ain't Gwen Cockshell. It is Gwen. That's Gwen Cockshell. Oh. Who is that? Who is that? Vicky. And that's oh, uh, yeah, who is that? Today. Vicky. <laughs> Yeah, a long time no see. Yeah. How you been? I'm fine. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> that was nice. Okay. If you're so old, you don't good. have any trouble remembering that. The young they might never forget. I know, I know that song. That's an old <laughs> song. Yeah. Old. Today she probably wouldn't laugh at the end. <laughs> you're right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Listen, folks, you're, my TV in case down. you didn't know where you are, you are at the Flood Discussion Group, uh, <laughs> and we are uh, starting the program. And let's look, before we get into hearing from Rebecca uh, Hankins, let's take a look at a three-clip video, um, a, a slideshow. And somebody found this. Who, who found this? And uh, Connie. Bon Connie. Tiny found it. Okay, great. Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, so if you're wondering why it's so hot before, here's your answer. Okay, take a look at number two. Here, we I don't know what city this was, but this is, it looks like in California or in Mexico because they paint the trees white. Okay, let's look uh, today. What, the, what does the tree, street look like? Oh. No trees. Okay. No more green. Con more concrete. Okay. Okay. All so concrete. Tonight, we're going to hear a presentation by Rebecca Hankins. And uh, Re Rebecca is with, uh, oh, where, where is this in my notes? Okay. Rebecca is the partnership manager with Forest Relief of Missouri. Relief spelled R-E-L-E-A-F. Uh, and so sh they have the website www.morelief.org. I sent out in the announcement. And so if you don't have that in front of you, then look at the announcement. I urge you to do that. Also, uh, there was an article about uh, that Rebecca was interviewed for for the Riverfront Times, and I have the link to that article. So before we get started, um, I want to ask Rebecca a critical question and uh, about the issue that you're going to cover. And the question is, do trees tend to grow better in a block of concrete or do trees grow better in soil? <laughs> you got to tell us. University City doesn't know. <laughs> the city government doesn't. So do you know? Um, well, yes, I do. And I'm sure by the end of this presentation, you all will know as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll leave you in suspense until the end. <laughs> OK, fantastic. So I'm turning it over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Don. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Um, as Don Don't said, I am. Full screen. Do you want me to go to full screen? Okay. What? Yeah. Um, I think you have to do that individually on your own, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. We should mute. Everybody should mute, but you too. Okay. Okay. Um, so I am the partnership manager with Forest Relief of Missouri. Um, I'm going to um, talk to you this evening about. Um, how trees affect climate crisis, flooding, and urban heat island. So let me share my screen. So we are where we are. Oh, yeah. And if everyone wants to mute, that would be great. Okay, can you all see my screen? Okay, switch. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on one second, y'all. <laughs> um. Okay. I think I got it now. Okay. All right. So, let's get started. All right, so climate change. This is a cover of National Geographic that came out in July of 2021. And I start with this because it's, even though climate crisis and climate change had really 
people had been talking about it, it really um, became center stage in 2021. And I'm going to get to uh, particularly why that is, but this cover is just so striking. Um, as you progress through the photos, you can see a very lush um, tree canopy lined street that dissolves into um, just buildings and no green anywhere. And of course, the um, you know the the premise is that trees and shade. Um, create a, um, a vast difference in terms of urban heat island, in terms of um, environmental issues. And so, but our focus today is on flood mitigation, gray infrastructure, and urban heat. So this is a really great graph um, to kind of illustrate how urban heat occurs. Um, and a lot of it revolves around um, buildings and roads, because all of that is built with concrete, which is also known as gray infrastructure. And so the more gray infrastructure that we have, um, all of the properties of concrete absorb heat and trap it. So even though when the sun goes down, it is still radiating heat outward, which creates that urban heat island. So out, you know, suburban, suburban areas, parks, rural areas, which have a lot less um, area of gray infrastructure, don't experience the urban heat island effect that um, cities do. So this is a really interesting um, slide that shows the, the loss of forest um, across America. And if particularly you focus on Missouri, you can see how over hundreds of years we have lost so much of our forested land. And Missouri um, still today does have quite a bit of forested land, but we also recognize that it has a lot of great infrastructure. So this is a really cool map that shows all of the great infrastructure. Now, I give this talk um, a lot about the city of St. Louis, and I know you guys are just located just outside of the city limits, um, but you can, and I'm sure you can locate on this map, um, University City, but you can see in this map, um, the denser the gray area, the more impervious or gray infrastructure there is. And so when we have um, a lot of impervious surface, it impacts the environment in three ways. So it creates that urban heat island effect that I was talking about. It also impacts stormwater and stormwater management. So obviously concrete is an impervious surface, which means as the water is hitting the ground, it's just shedding and going into our sewer systems. So there isn't the ground or the soil to trap the water. but it also limits our planting spaces. So the more gray infrastructure we have, the fewer spaces, available spaces we have for planting things like trees and other um, plant material. So we're gonna focus quickly on stormwater. So this is a really cool image of a tree um, during rain. So as you can see in the image, if you look closely at the road, the road is wet, except for under the tree. And that's because the tree is able to capture stormwater or rainwater before it actually hits the ground. So a, a mature canopy tree can capture up to 1500 gallons of water before it ever hits the ground. So it, you can imagine an area that is full of trees doesn't have the influx of rain that's happening in a large rain event, um, which are becoming more and more frequent as the climate crisis um, is, is getting more prevalent. And so without those trees to capture that, that 1500 gallons of water, it's going straight onto these impervious surfaces and then going into our sewer systems. So this map is a map of tree canopy in St. Louis. 
So all the areas in green are areas where tree canopy is identified. So I want you to pay close attention to the areas that are marked in red. So you can see there's very little green in those areas. So putting the two maps side by side, the one with gray infrastructure and then our tree canopy map, well, you notice that yeah. wherever there's lots of gray infrastructure, there's very little tree canopy. So there's a correlation between high gray infrastructure and low tree canopy. Here's another tree canopy map, um, and this is broken up by wards. And the lighter the green, the lower the tree canopy. The darker the green, the higher the tree canopy. This is a map of urban heat. So as you can see, areas with lower tree canopy correlate with areas of higher urban heat. Again, going back to that idea where there's a lot of gray infrastructure, that there's fewer plantable spaces. Also, the gray infrastructure is trapping heat and is radiating it back out. So you can see temperatures as much as 10 degrees hotter in urban heat islands. And all of this correlates with redlining maps. So this is, um, and if you don't know what redlining is, redlining was a practice that was done in um, when they were um, evaluating homeowners' ability to get um, bank loans. And so banks did this to assess, um, to sign a grade to home, home values. And, to allow homeowners to um, receive a bank loan or not. And so they would divide up areas um, in cities and not just St. Louis, this was a, a practice done across all major cities um, into uh, grades of A, B, C, and D. A being the best and D being considered hazardous, meaning they didn't deem it was worth investing in. So they wouldn't provide loans for homes or businesses to renovate or establish new business. And so as you can see in this map of St. Louis, the areas in red, which were red lined, correlate with areas of low tree canopy today. And you can see um, in the C category, um, University City, um, areas of University City were uh, marked as well. So what we know for sure. So this is a map from the EPA and this is the recent past. And at that time, the, much of the US had fewer than 10 days of 100 degree temperatures. So there's Missouri. So on average, 10 days or less of 100 degrees. Here is a EPA projection over the next 60 years. So as climate change is increasing, they've provided two scenarios. Scenarios where we're able to lower our emissions and scenarios where emissions continue. And as you can see, Missouri is no longer yellow. It is now in the orange and almost red zones where we're going to be experiencing on average 30 days or more of 100 degree days. That's an entire month. And what we do know is that heat related illnesses are actually the number one cause of death. So most people don't realize that heat exacerbates so many more um, health issues. So um, heat stroke, um, which can then precipitate heart attacks, um, stroke, a lot of other issues are exacerbated by heat. And we're finding that heat is actually the number one killer of, for most people because it then is an onset for many other problems. So going back to the cover of the National Geographic from July, 2021, why this is so important? Because this is the same street in, this is in Los Angeles, 
And the images are all taken from one street. It's just as you move down the street, you can see how you progress from an area of more affluent to a less affluent area of the of that city, all in the same street. And we have similar examples in St. Louis. If you drive down Kings Highway, for example, and you are um, near the hospital and near Forest Park, and as you start to head north, you'll notice tree canopy declines along the street. And why this is important is because in a um, in 2020, of course, George Floyd was murdered and justice issues began to be talked about. Well, that lens of social justice switched to environmental justice, or I guess it didn't switch, but it, it broadened to environmental justice. And a lot of um, organizations began to realize that a lot of the social justices were also creating environmental injustices. And so the, the fact that the National Geographic um, posted this as their um, cover in July of 2021, really opened up the door for a lot of conversations um, in environmental justice and really um, understanding what foresters have known for a long time um, about urban forestry in that areas with low tree canopy are simultaneously suffering from higher um, uh, uh, heat, so they have higher um, degrees of heat because of that heat island. Um, they're having uh, more problems with stormwater management. Um, they're seeing a lot more uh, public health problems, um, all related to um, lack of tree cover. So this is a North City Park, and this is in the winter time. And for most people, this is just a very, um, something that they see every day and they don't really pay attention to trees. So the conversation around trees is always challenging, um, particularly in communities that are um, hard hit by lower tree canopy because they don't often pay attention to the trees that are there until they're not. So you all are aware of the emerald ash borer that is going through and ravaging trees across the city, um, across the region. And so in the city of St. Louis, there were more than 16,000 ash trees on for street trees. And so the city has been slowly um, taking those trees down. And a lot of North City is planted with um, ash trees. And so entire blocks will lose their trees all at one time. And that's often when um, residents begin to take notice and really begin to be open to conversations about how trees can play a role in bettering their community. At the same time that that National Geographic cover um, came out in 2021, American Forests um, is a national organization. They um, released this really cool program called the Tree Equity Score. And they have mapped cities all across the nation, and they have basically created a scorecard for cities down to the census block level. And so as you can see here, um, of course, St. Louis, when you look at it, you see all of those orange areas. Of course, green is a better grade. Orange is progressively worse. They all match with all of the other maps that I've shared with you already. Um, and so it's this is a really interesting website and I highly encourage you all to explore um, on your own. It is, it's so fascinating because it, it not only looks at tree canopy, but it looks at population density. It looks at um, percentage of people of color, um, poverty rates, children, um, so it, 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 it takes into account all of these um, intersecting um, measurements and then creates this tree equity score. And so this idea that um, tree equity, that trees are not equitably distributed across cities, across regions um, is really telling. And, it, and that data really helps um, organizations like ours to be able to champion for more trees where they're needed most. 
And so I took the time to go ahead and download um, University's tree equity score map. Um, and as you can see, um, there's a lot of green in University City, but there's also quite a bit of orange. And it's, of course, it's that area that's closest to North County. Um, I've actually done a lot of work in the 24-1, which um, Wellston begins. Um, so it touches up to those northern parts of University City. But as you explore the map on your own, you'll begin to see um, how all of that data um, really creates this um, interesting picture. And you can really learn a lot about where trees are located and how they intersect with um, who's living where um, and what resources they have access to. And if you'd like, I can, I did make this a clickable link. I'm not sure how much time we have, so I didn't want to um, say that we would go into it and explore it on our uh, together, but I do highly um, encourage you to explore it on your own. Um, let me finish. So those of you who may not know um, Forest Relief, we are a nonprofit tree nursery. We serve the entire state of Missouri. We grow, distribute, and plant trees. So we're um, very unique as a nonprofit in that we actually grow the trees. So we grow about 20,000 trees um, at our uh, operation in Creek Core Park. And we're actually looking to expand our growing operations into the city of St. Louis um, in partnership with Missouri State Parks at the Scott Joplin House. Um, and we would create a satellite operation where we would be uh, growing an additional 3,000 trees um, and being able to invite city residents, city schools to participate and really kind of get that hands-on experience that might be difficult for them to access out in the county. Um, and as we talk about the climate crisis and trees as a solution for the climate crisis, um, we have to recognize that somebody has to be growing those trees. And so we're really excited that we're an organization that is growing those trees as well as distributing and planting them. Um, if you um, have extra time on your hands, um, we love volunteers. Um, we are a small staff. Um, we've actually grown quite a bit in the last year. Um, when I started, we were just a staff of five, and now we're up to a staff of 10. Some of those are part-time um, staff, but to grow 20,000 trees, you need a lot of hands to help um, grow those trees and get those trees ready to be um, shipped out into the communities um, that they serve. Um, and so, you know, we always welcome people who'd love to volunteer with us, um, whether you want to volunteer once or be a um, regular, we, we love that. Um, we're celebrating 30 years. Um, so we're really excited that we've been around this long and um, we're just really letting, wanting people to know who we are and what we're doing. Um, our nursery operations um, include a certified arboretum. We just got certified as a level two arboretum. So if you've never been out to our nursery, um, you can come out, um, walk um, the, the nursery grounds and take a look at the trees that we give away for free. Um, we grow all Missouri natives. Um, and we do provide a lot of educational experiences for the public. Um, for example, like talking with you all. Um, our trees do get planted on public and nonprofit lands through two main programs. Um, and we have a vision of growing a more resilient tree canopy over the next 20 years that support healthy people, healthy habitats, and a healthy planet. Um, something to remember is that trees take a long time to grow. Um, and so we always like to um, leave you with a final thought that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen and open it up to questions. So just if anybody has any questions, please let me know. I have know. a question. This is Bessie. Yeah. I have a question. So do you um, talk to people about maintaining trees and um, what what needs to be done for trees? Trees need to be managed. And so is there some portion of your program that 
works toward tree management? So that is something that we're kind of getting into um, as we recognize that um, education really is very important. So for 30 years, we've been primarily a growing operation and distribution. Um, I would say within the last 10 to 15 years, we have focused on tree plantings. Um, but even that we've gotten better at, um, we used to just plant and walk away as so many people do. And we recognize that we're the, we're leaving those trees to um, the, the environment to and crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. And that was not a successful way of tree planting, um, particularly in these um, communities where uh, tree canopy is very low. And so we have um, taken on stewardship activities in those um, public spaces. And so we now steward our trees um, for the first two years of establishment. So we are uh, consist consistently watering and we're recognizing that um, even um, so, and we provide information and all those people who um, plant trees on um, that they get from us can ask us questions, but it's, we don't usually help with like private property trees. And so a lot of just everyday homeowners haven't like called us and been like, Hey, how do we, you know, take care of our trees? But it is something that we recognize that if we want to make a bigger impact in that tree canopy number, we have to be helping private property homeowners because 80% of land is owned privately. Mm -hmm. So it is something that we are um, looking at and maybe moving toward, but it is not something we have in place today, like a resource for um, maintenance um, that homeowners can just get to. So thank you, Betsy. Uh, Tree, tr I've come to recognize. I, I, uh, Betsy, um, I'm going to be moderating the discussion. This is Don, and uh, I hope that everybody could keep their comments to three minutes. And also, there's also uh, there's already a couple of hands up. Uh, I wanted to add something to the presentation uh, that um, we, we just heard uh, my, from Rebecca. My specialty is in environmental psychology, and there's some studies that I think they're very interesting uh, about trees and greenery. Uh, one is where where people have surgery done and you either have a view of greenery or you don't. Right. And one study of people had gallbladder surgery, they, they could either look out the window and see green space, or they could look out a window and see a brick wall. And yeah. the people who uh, saw uh, green space were more likely to uh, recover quicker, have less oh, yeah. for pain Absolutely. medications, and had fewer negative, uh, reaction, negative nursing notes. Uh -huh. Another one that looked at appendectomy surgery uh, found similar sorts of things, except they had 12 plants in the hospital room. And if you've ever been in a hospital room, you know that 12 plants is a lot. And yeah, so there was, there was a difference in that they uh, stayed in the hospital a shorter period of time. Again, they needed less pain medication. They had lower yeah. blood pressure, less pain, anxiety, and fatigue. And course, when yeah. people asked them, what was the best thing about your room? If they said, if they had 12 plants in their room, they said not over 90% said the best thing about my room was the plants. If they mm -hmm. did not have plants in the room, they said the best thing about my room was the TV set. <laughs> so, and, and then my uh, last one I want to mention is my favorite study. Uh, I call it the walk in the park study. It, it looked at children with uh, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And the, the researchers took them on a walk either through a park um, through the downtown area or through the neighborhood. And then they gave them a cognitive uh, test that was sort of complicated uh, for uh, kids with ADHD. And what they found was that they was about the same result for kids who walked uh, through the neighborhood or who walked downtown. The kids who walked through a park did a lot better on the cognitive task. And when they estimated how much better they did, it was the equivalent of taking a dose of Ritalin. Mm -hmm. And so kids could be actually be better off and be able to concentrate more if they, if they were in a, uh, an environment. Now, putting these together and knowing that trees and other greenery tends to relax people and concrete areas may do not relax, but they also leave people hot and irritable. I got to ask the question, what happens if on a hot day, somebody is walking around, 
they're they're really hot from where they live. They're they're hot from their car drive. They're hot, you know, walking down the street. They have a gun with them, and somebody comes up and starts messing with them. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you can figure out if somebody is messing with you and you're hot and you're irritable, the 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 chances that something exploding is is much much higher. And so I think that in University City, we really need to talk about like the very soon the city is going to be talking about where the old police station is um, on on Trinity. You know, when when they move that out, that used to be a children's playground. Are they going to turn that back into uh, turn that into green space, or is University City going to keep it covered with asphalt? You know, we we need to be asking the city managers that. So uh, I'm going to I'm taking a stack for Don, and I don't know that Betsy was finished, but I have Tony, Gwen, and then Maureen, and I will look for hands up. If I miss you, just call out. Okay, uh, Betsy, I interrupted you. Could could you finish what we were saying? Okay, you're muted. You're muted, Betsy. Sorry. Um, I, I've learned that you know, tree maintenance is extremely important. And we've had lots of several instances locally of trees falling on people at, with storms and times with even with their aunt storms. I recently had some really large branches drop out of a tree in front of my house on a perfectly lovely day. Just these really big branches just fell out of a big tree. So, and it's an old tree, but I, I've become much more interested in tree maintenance. So tree planting is wonderful. I think it's great. I love trees. And just to, one other thing, if anybody notices the trees on Kingsland, um, the, the island on Kingsland, they look very sad. I was wondering who, does anybody know who was responsible for that property? That it, I, it's a, a county road or a state road? I think, Kingsland, I think it is a county them. road and that would... I mean it's the county's responsibility i believe yeah okay those trees really look very sad yeah, yeah it's, it's good to look, look into that you have a city council person and that person might help to confirm for sure if it's a city uh, property or if it's county property yeah it's probably county maintenance uh, okay uh it's tony okay but could i could i add to, about the county trees uh, i understand the county will not be replacing County trees along um, Delmar, for example, uh, that's that's a county county maintained area. So all of those trees that we've been used to driving along on Delmar, when they disappear, the county has no plans to replant them. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, that's something I hear circulating. Uh, I don't know that any changes are planned. It's a financial issue. So we need tree advocates to uh, speak up for these kinds of things. Okay, Tony. So uh, to what Kathy said, uh, St. Louis County has, I live on Del Mar. St. Louis County has told me I can chop down any tree in my tree line in front of my house, but I'm not allowed to replace it because that would be a new responsibility for them. Wow. And to what Betsy said um, about uh, learning about tree maintenance, uh, Seed St. Louis, formerly Gateway Greening, has a lot of great educational classes that you can attend on Zoom. And they always record their classes and they have an extensive YouTube channel that has probably a nice assortment of videos on tree maintenance. Okay, fantastic. And guard all gardening subjects. Uh, I just have a question. So Seed St. Louis is what Gateway Greening was? Yes. Huh. Thank you. Okay. And they have moved to Del Mar Divine. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And they're going to be putting up a new demonstration garden there. Okay, great. Okay, Gwen? Um, yes, uh, the problem we have when you, we love the trees over here, the people want to ask for trees to come, but what they did was they dumped these sap dra- dropping uh red, I don't know what's coming out of these maple, birch, ash trees over on this, um, in this community, and people are outraged. And me especially, I have a beautiful tree in front of my house. It's been here for now for like 10 years, and it drops sap all over my cars. It does it, and now everybody is fighting for space. 
from under the trees. And now the lady across the street is one of her trees cut down and everybody is talking about cutting down the trees. So I'm saying that we want the trees, but these trees that drip this sap and destroy your cars, it's a turnoff to people. And, and now they're saying and asking me, how can they get the tree cut down? And the ones that they planted last year, that's really small. The lady took a, um, a saw to it so uh, and cut it down herself. So that's the problem. And the other thing is, is that they don't think about it when they over here. They said that we're going to plant any more trees, that the stumps get bigger. And they, that's not true over here. They just planted anything. And now the trees are pulling up the roots of the, I mean, pulling up the concrete. So they have to be strategic and they have to plant trees where the, the, the people would enjoy the tree, but not destroy their property. So that's a concern in our neighborhood. Uh, okay. Uh so uh, let's see, is Maureen next? Yes. Okay, Maureen. Oh, um, hi. I just uh, wanted to say like in Massachusetts, my town Southbridge is also an environmental justice community. And uh, not too long ago, uh, there was a big campaign about closing our landfill and there was a lot about our air and everything. Um, and now they're, we got this grant to give these trees away and it is so hard to give them away because people don't understand how valuable trees are. Okay, okay. Uh, they see them as a liability. They don't yes. want them to fall on their roof or whatever. Um, and, you know, I'm working with the people like not working, working, but um, sympathizing um with the people doing the planting and i'm like i don't know we have to find a way to let people know educate them without you know like sitting them down in a classroom they're not gonna do that no. um i don't know how we can educate them if if anybody has any ideas i'd appreciate it thank you uh, okay, in terms of educating people about concerns with trees, if Tammy Turner is on, Tammy, would you tell us if you have any, uh, if any of your, your relatives or friends have any concern with trees. Are you on, Tammy? Oh, uh -huh, I'm here. I had to be on the phone because uh, my, my, I can't figure out Zoom on my phone. I had to call in. But anyway, uh, when I was a kid, my, um, uh, father uh, you know my parents we had a big huge beautiful oak tree in the front yard and they had it cut down uh because it was messing with the pipes or the electrical wires i was a kid i'm not exactly sure but it was messing up some aspect of the house and i know and then once they got that tree cut more than likely in northwood the, the houses were all built at the same time and the trees all planted at the same time and people were getting trees cut down right and left. And um, I recently, I was telling Don, I was gonna ask my daddy and I recently asked uh past couple of days uh, when Don had mentioned about when you cut down a tree for whatever reason you have to, then you replant a tree and I asked dad, I said, Dad, you did you ever think about replanting the tree? And he was like, Oh no. Nah. And then he went ahead went on and on about the breaking leaves and you know and and so people are truly, truly not educated about the importance of the tree. And I was thinking about it. I walk all the time. And this is the last thing I'm gonna say. I walk all the time and I thought about how when I walk, because I live across the street from where I grew up now. And when I walked to the bus stop one morning, I was really, really hot, but I work at Forest Park and you know, it's a bunch of trees in that area and the park and all of that. And I realized how much cooler I was when I was walking to work as opposed to just 
just switching neighborhoods, getting on the bus, being on the bus 15, 20 minutes and walking. So it's got to be a way to educate people about the importance of trees and how when you cut down the tree for various reasons, your pipes and all of that, how you have to replant one. Because I I never thought about it till I was talking to Don before this presentation. So that's what I got to say. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, I, I want to throw the last three or four comments back to Rebecca and basically say, uh, ask her how you deal with these concerns about trees. And I think several of them could be grouped together in terms of strategic placement of trees. Like Barb and me really like a beautiful old oak tree right next to our house. Unfortunately, in Ward 3, the homes are, I mean, Ward 2, but on, um, on Dartmouth Street, the houses are really close together. And so this tree, which, what is it, 40 or 50 feet tall? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's beautiful old oak tree. The problem mm -hmm. is it's much taller than the house. And when these winds were coming last summer, I kept thinking, man, is that, is that tree going to blow I over know. at our house? Is it going to smash our roof? And, and uh, Gwen talked about, you know, trees and how they can uh, mess up cars. And um, so, so there's, there's a lot of issues with trees. Do you have any suggestions for dealing uh, with the, the planning, the placement, the care of trees so that, uh, I mean, you pointed out, you don't just stick a tree in the ground and walk away. <laughs> you know, you got to plan it out first. So, so could you comment some about that? Yeah, I mean, I hear um, all of these things that you guys are talking about. Um, these are all very valid um, concerns that people have about trees. And it is hard to overcome um, some of these arguments and these fears because they're very grounded um, in what the reality is for people. And as the climate crisis grows and now we're dealing with, um, you know, huge unexpected storms and all of this, like it, it, it's adding stress. So we've got drought, which is stressing out the trees and nobody's watering or like even mature trees at some point when there's just so much drought, right? We, we all saw the sycamores earlier this summer and they just like their leaves like all shriveled up pretty quickly. Um, you know, they're under stress and year after year of that sort of drought stress is going to begin to have the tree fail. And then suddenly a branch is going to fall and people are like, well, that's a bad species because, you know, but it's, it's, it's compounded by all of the climate crisis. And, you know, all of us could be doing a little bit more to care for young trees, um, mature trees. We're, we're just so used to an environment where we can just walk away and not think about trees until they begin to fail. Unfortunately, a lot of our canopy in the region is matured. It's, I mean, trees are living things, right? They age just like we do. They begin to fail just as we will. And so how we have to recognize that they need a little care. Like very few people want to pay for pruning of their trees. Um, and so, but pruning, regular pruning can help, you know, keep your tree strong um, and have it live longer. Um, and so these costs, right? I would love to have conversations with cities about how do we actually recognize trees as a green infrastructure that is actually bringing services to a city and how can they begin to help cover some of these costs that have been the the, the burden of a private homeowner, right? So could, could we get tax credits for having trees on private property? Could we um, see a 50-50 maintenance program for trees, um, you know, things like that. But these are like bigger conversations because nobody's had to really deal with it because it just hasn't been an issue. But now we're here and all of these issues are compounding. We've got insect and disease pressure. So we've got emerald ash borer and we've got oak gall and we've got wilt and we've got all of these things that are like compounding all of these trees and tree species. And it feels like suddenly everything is going wrong. Um, but it, you know, we all can make a difference in the trees that are around us and give them all a little bit of love. Um, and it will go a long way. So, um, you know, just keep fighting the good fight, keep educating people around you about how, why trees are so important. Um, 
you know, and just getting trees in the ground. A lot of um, tree stories that I hear from people are because they received a tree at school when they were in like fourth grade and their parents really didn't want to plant it, but the kid really wanted the tree planted. So they planted it. Right. And then they were going to pull that tree out because it, it was their kid's tree. And so that's how a lot of our urban canopy has come about. Um, but those programs have sort of fallen away. You don't hear about that as much. Um, and so that renewal of the canopy is, is we're seeing a lot of trees age and, and fail and not a lot of new canopy coming in to replace it. Um, and so we've got to be very mindful that we have to take a very proactive approach um, to stewarding our trees and our tree canopy. So, so, okay, just a second, Claudine, I'll call on you in just a second. Rebecca, so mm -hmm. would your um, organization help provide advice to organizations or individuals that are thinking of planting a tree and wanted to do it in the right way? Absolutely. I mean, we um, have a tree planting guide um, that we can provide to people who are planting new trees. Um, and, you know, as I said, just um, we are trying to expand our educational opportunities. Um, it's something we're kind of growing into. So it's not something we just have readily available, but we recognize the need for it. And we um, support people getting educated. A lot of tree care companies have monthly newsletters that you could sign up for and have a lot of great advice on how to care for trees. Um, you know, so you don't have to necessarily use their tree care, but you can sign up for their newsletters. Um, I like uh, Metropolitan uh, Forestry Service, particularly. They have had an interesting newsletter, but a lot of nonprofits, um, I think theirs is quarterly, but um, it's, it is something that I think is very important that we just continue to have conversations. Okay, Claudia. Oops. Hi, um, I, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I have a, a little bit of a dilemma. Uh, I uh, viewed the New York Times Climate Forward Conference last weekend. Al Gore and a bunch of heavy hitters were there and someone made the point that um, planting trees was only part of the issue. Uh, that it was, a, you know, it, it was a big part, but it was only a part uh, that electric vehicles had to, you know, be right up there at the, at the top of this list. And I've been myself thinking about um, getting uh, an electric car. I'm by myself, you know, I don't do a lot of traveling and, you know, they're good for 200 mile radius, let's say. Um, I had a solar panel company come out to my house and they said <laughs> that um, I had too many trees. Yeah, I live uh, on the street behind Dom, Don and Barb and on Amherst. And the, I, the natural thing to do would be to put it on my garage roof. And I have a big silver maple and my neighbor has a, a sycamore tree and uh, my silver maple, is kind of on its, maybe not on its last legs, but it's, you know, 50 years old. And I'm thinking to myself, do I take a tree down to put solar panels on the roof? How do you, how do you advise some this? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how to think about it. So a silver maple is what they call, um, um, uh, oh my gosh, I totally just blinked on the word. Um, Junk tree. Yeah. <laughs> it's, really? um, it's, no, there's a, there's a word for it now. I totally, I can't believe I totally blinked on it. But like, so when a forest is like disturbed by fire, for instance, um, you know, fast growing species come in to help stabilize the soil. And so silver maple. What? Pioneer. Pioneer. Pioneer, species. Pioneer species. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of our fast growing species like silver maples, those are considered like pioneer species and they're not intended to live as long as an oak. And so if you are recognizing that your silver maple is close to end of life, 
it might be a good choice if you have the means now to just go ahead and have it, you know, pruned back heavily or removed um, and install your solar panels. Because yes, trees are just one part of the solution. They are one of the most cost-effective parts of the solution, which is why trees are so um, so powerful in the conversation of climate crisis. They are not the only solution. Um, I was at a part of a panel of a climate forum through Focus St. Louis last week, and we had experts there um, talking about green buildings and just how much um, carbon emissions uh, is created by um, housing stock, like housing stock creates so much of um, our emissions problem more, you know, more than we realize. And so, you know, upgrading buildings, becoming energy efficient in your home absolutely is, should be something that you weigh against, you know, does it, you know, does it, yes, you're taking out a tree, but you know, you're, you're getting your savings. There's a lot of free tools online called like iTree tools where you can kind of calculate like the cost of it, like the tree, like the benefits of that tree, how much CO2 is it capturing, oh. things like that. Um, they're free tools. Um, it, they're kind of hard to um, maybe to, if you don't have like the knowledge, but there is like instructions on how to use them and you can kind of weigh it against like, okay, well, when will I see the benefits of those solar panels versus, you know, what the tree is doing? Could you, you know, could you do a two for one replant somewhere else? Could you organize a tree planting along the streets, along in a park, in a, you know, a public space um, mm -hmm. where you're, ma you're making up for those benefits of having that tree removed? Could you convince a neighbor to take a tree? Um, you know, it's 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 hard. It's hard to advise, um, but you know, having conversations and and really weighing through, you know, what are what's a good way forward it, it's it's a good way. It's a good place to start. So, thank you. Hey, Barbara wanted to say something. Oh, I just had a question for Rebecca. I read or somebody emailed me information that the city, St. Louis City, is going to be receiving a fair amount of money, like $8 million for tree planting. Have you mm -hmm. heard about that? Yes, they um, received money from the IRA funding that the government um, issued, which is fantastic. Missouri actually um, received quite a bit. So between Kansas City, St. Louis, and Bell Fountain neighbors, um, yeah, we received like 20 $3 million for the state of Missouri, which is really great. That is really great news. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out and if we can get some new trees planted in those parts of the city that don't have a lot of trees right now. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know who's uh, actually organizing that or making decisions about how that's going to be spent? Um, the forestry commissioner, um, Alan Jankowski, is, um, and his department will be managing um, how that money is spent. Um, hopefully, some of it's going to maintenance. So currently, the city does not um, have any maintenance um, budget or crew. Um, I see Roy had posted in here that a number of the replacement trees are either near death, sick, or dead. Um, yeah, so the city they replants. Are. And, and crosses its fingers and hopes a neighbor will do the right thing and water, but neighbors don't know that they need to water. They don't rec they don't realize that the city's not coming around and maintaining these trees. So one of the things that Forest Relief is doing um, is we're going to be piloting a um, watering reminder program for where new street trees are planted. We're gonna be um, canvassing and letting neighbors know that the city is hoping that you will water those trees and take a, an active participation in it. Um, another thing that um, Forest Relief is doing is piloting um, street tree maintenance uh, in partnership with the city. So um, we will be looking at areas just like University City is broken up into wards, of course the city has wards and not all of the wards have the same amount of budget for tree planting, um, it's not equal. And so in those wards where um, there might not be budget for trees, um, we're looking at, you know, how can we help go help the city plant 
and steward those trees. So that's part of some of the um, growing operations for forest relief. Some of those, um, you know, those additional um, people that I've mentioned were hired um, are doing that work. And so um, we're really excited about being able to, to do this, but it's not yet something that we can be like, okay, this is how you do it. And, you know, cause if we let everybody know, then everybody's gonna be, you know, Hey, come water our trees. Come do this thing, right? And so it's it's a slow process, but I don't know if it's good news or bad news. I one would think it was bad news, I think, but or coffee. But in St. Louis City right now, water isn't metered, so it's really no extra cost to drag a hose out and water right. the tree. <laughs> well, I'm not against that, but I did have a peach tree that produced over 300 peaches last year, and like for the last six years. But this year I pruned it and, and fertilized it and everything. The peaches came back. It was only 10 of them, maybe 20, but they were bigger. But my daughter's magnolia tree didn't blossom either. They just turned, it turned black. Everything turned black on them. And I, I thought it was from that last frost. Do you yeah. think I should, you think it's, what's the frost or you think it's not gonna produce again? What's the frost, I know. Yeah, I'm frost. sure it was the frost, yeah. Yeah, because I was looking forward to those peaches. They were larger because I, I, I pruned it so he told me so the sun can come in. And I grew that tree from a twig and uh, they had nice sweet peaches. So next year I'll just, and I'll never cut it down because I grew it from my father's peach tree. So I'll never, I'll use it for shade in the back, but okay. I just wanted to know, was it from the frost? Thing based on what Gwen just said, I think it's really important to understand the emotional relationship between many people and their trees. I mean, it is very strong. Um, okay. So we have hands up. Uh, okay, we're going to go to Tony, but first I want to respond to what was said a, a couple of conversations ago. And that is, I strongly believe that eco gadgets, you know, are really uh, way, way behind, you, you know, they're, they're not very high up in the hierarchy of good solutions. Uh, sometimes they work, but generally they don't. There's some reports years ago that where uh, a person compared small homes and uh, with no eco gadgets, uh, 50, uh, 1,800 square foot homes with, with no eco gadgets and 3,000 square foot homes with every eco gadget like in a- Excuse know, me, what are eco gadgets? Oh, okay, like a solar panel, you know, with a solar powered uh, uh, lines and a blender, or all, all these all these gadgets that you can buy that are supposed to be eco friendly, and and what they found was that the total uh, amount of energy by the eighteen hundred square foot home was less than with no eco gadgets. It was much more energy efficient than a <laughs> three thousand square foot home with uh, you know, and this was several homes with all sorts of eco gadgets. And a couple of eco gadgets that I think that uh, people really make a mistake in going to is uh, solar panels on roofs uh, to cut down trees. I think maybe if you have a tree, I've, I've seen some trees like the Chinese tree of heaven that was where the, I, when I used to live on Harvard, those are horrible. I'd, I'd saw those down in a minute because I don't think they're really trees. I think they're a great big uh, um, weed. You know, you know, so, so there's the trees, but in general, I think that uh, putting um, solar panels, you know, you know, a tree is a vastly better solution to cooling the house than, than a solar panel. To, uh, and and a, the solar panel uses electricity, and most people measure the electricity simply by the amount of electricity that is used, that is used in the house. But somebody had to manufacture that solar panel. Somebody had to uh, conduct the wires that connect the solar panel to the eco gadgets. Somebody has to handle those solar panels when they turn into trash. And, and there are huge deposits of solar panels all over the, especially in Texas, but there are in a lot of different places. Another, which I think is an even worse eco gadget is the electric car. Um, the, the, oh, the, the, please the stop. The, 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 the electric car, doesn't solve the problem of the fact that we have cars. The, the real issue is how do we have walkable, cyclable neighborhoods? 
how do people get the things that they need to do without having two, three, and four cars for every family? That's the solution we need to work for, not having, um, not, 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 subject, not substituting one gadget for another. Okay, Tony, go ahead. All right, Don, you're being really unfair to the technologies of the future. We have got to wean ourselves off fossil fuel, which are destroying our planet. And these eco gadgets are heading towards the solutions that we need to survive as a race. I mean, it, they, they aren't perfect, but they are heading in the right direction. And we need to really be investing in these kind of technologies and I don't think people should chop down all their trees for solar panels. I don't think that's happening. I think people are making selective decisions to add solar. And when you're talking about a huge house with solar versus a tiny house without, that's about somebody's um, footprint. Uh, eco what am I trying to uh about somebody's material, consumption, material about somebody, about consumption, people who have huge houses and have solar panels, it's, it's not the solar panels fault that they have a huge house that is not energy efficient. And right now there are great incentives to get solar panels. Oh. If you have a good sun profile at your location, there's a 30% a government tax uh, not a rebate, but uh, a tax credit. And Ameren has a good rebate program right now also, if somebody's thinking about solar. Obviously trees are great, but they do take a long time to grow and a lot of people aren't growing trees. And uh, we need to change how we think about trees in general. Someone was talking about how their dad doesn't want trees because then he has to rake the leaves. And we have this, we've developed this mindset of our beautiful lawns. There's nothing natural about having a grass lawn. That is a manufactured, that's a Victorian era uh, idea that was about showing wealth and the ability to pay somebody to mow a space. So uh, if you do have trees in your yard, you probably shouldn't be raking the leaves. You should be leaving them on the ground to nourish your soil. It's free mulch. And it also encourages insects and wildlife to establish in your yard, which those insects feed the birds. We're losing our birds. It's uh, Carbon footprint is, we all need to reduce our carbon footprint. We have a huge carbon footprint compared to people who live in China who don't consume nearly as much as we do. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, okay, then I'm gonna, there's a few other things that we need to, uh, that I need to bring up for the program. One is there's going to be uh, a week from to no, it's next October 3rd. That is uh, six days from today. There is a stormwater commission meeting. I'm going to be giving a presentation there and other people are going to be there uh, uh, talking about the pervious surface bill that we're submitting to University City to, uh, um, to offset the, you know, the, the increase in concrete and the increase in asphalt and other impervious surfaces. So it would really, and if you want to uh, find anything about that, uh, then just send me an email. Everybody here should have gotten an email from me. So just send me an email and I can send you the one page summary of the purview surface bill, or if you want to read it, the, the entire bill. Um, okay. And I hope that people get involved and things like that, because in these discussions, we have a lot of really good ideas, but those ideas don't go anywhere unless you reach some sort of agreement on what you want to do and write it into law. Because I, can, I have worked with a lot of uh, university city politicians, and I can tell you that every single one of them is absolutely excellent 
at telling you that they're going to, they support you, they believe in you, they're going to do everything they can to in, support environmental ideas, and then turn around and do absolutely nothing. And so <laughs> unless we have some things written into law that say exactly where we want to go, you're not holding the politician's feet to the pro, uh, fire. Just to, just to say, hear a song and a dance is from a politician won't help. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, need some people to help with the, um, the, the environmental task force. So if you're able to do research, you know, or if you're able to do anything else, we would, we would love to get your participation. Um, and I, is there any, any last closing comments? Okay, well, I'll, I'll just have one, one, uh, one closing comment about uh, technology. And uh, I think that technology is really, really, it's, technology is like water. It's really, really great. It's absolutely necessary to survive, but if you have too much, you can drown in it. Uh, so our, our next discussion is going to be um, four weeks from today, I believe, which will be what, October the 12th, well, fourth, fourth Wednesday in, in October. And so it was great to have everybody here and I hope everybody can, uh, can join us. Oh, if you have an idea for what we can discuss during one of these floods uh, webinars, things that relate to floods, uh, and water and somehow, you know, s send an email along, you know, we really would like to hear about that. And thank you, Rebecca. That was a great program. Yeah, fantastic. Oh we, we will, we will tell everybody about it. Okay. If you, thank if you so much for having me. I appreciate you all. Okay. So we're ready for the song again. Okay. If you came in late, if you didn't hear the song at the beginning, you got to stay on until the song is over. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Because if uh, if you you won't really appreciate the um, the meeting tonight unless you hear the song. Okay, Joe, are we ready with it? Okay, folks. Until October twenty fifth, uh, our next right. discussion. Or if you can come on October third to the Stormwater Commission meeting at the Community Center in University City, we would love to see you there. Okay, so long, folks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, I'll be damned. There was Amy. Wow, that was a good one. Thank mm -hmm.